What I did is I took uh, the data for one year of uh, suicides in Japan and I mapped that onto a piano keyboard. Second time meeting because I right. met you at the Masonic Lodge. That's right. And it was your hundred and what? I think it was the hundred and fiftieth. Hundred and fiftieth anniversary right, yeah. of that lodge here. That's right. Yeah. Wow, that was such an event, and I I almost thought about joining, and I won't say I won't join yet, but you have some really good people there. You yeah, mean, Gordon's the guy. Gordon's the guy. If you, if you haven't met Gordon, you need to meet Gordon. He's really, he's on the podcast too. Last name is Campbell, right? That's right. Yeah, Gordon Campbell, and um, look through the podcast and you'll meet him. You you won't be disappointed. You'll like his podcast. Roy, let me ask you this: mm. Give me a brief idea of how you grew up, sure. family, and everything. So I uh, grew up um, about two hours outside of Toronto. Ontario and Canada and uh, a bit of a rural experience and growing up everybody was the same uh, they looked all the same and everything everyone ate the same food and it was really boring and you know my mother's side of the family came from England and Ireland so every day she's cooking you know potatoes as you know the main potatoes potatoes every day is potatoes right and so, but I had this desire for, for something different, right? I've always been interested in uh, different uh, cultures and different people, but at that time, you know, I, the only access to it was through books or, or movies and that. So then I went to uh, university in Toronto, the University of Toronto. Are you uh, the only child? Uh, I have a brother, actually. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Yeah, I have a big brother, but he's a lot older than me. He's 13 years older than me. Same mother and father. Same mother and father. So when I was five years old, he was already 18 and moved out. So you guys aren't close? Um, we were for periods, but we're kind of like in uh, different worlds, you know. Right. And um, But yeah, he's a good guy. Is he still in Canada? He is, yeah, he's still in and Canada. And mom and dad, how are they doing? Well, my father just passed away in uh, October. Oh, I'm sorry September, End of that. September, yeah. Oh. And um, so now it's just my mom and, you How know, old was he when he passed? He was, I believe, 80. Too. That's not a bad run, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would it, I mean, was he? Was he? I mean, was it because of health issues that he died? Yeah, he had uh, Parkinson's and he was in the hospital. And then, uh, how long? Did he, how long was he in the hospital with Parkinson? Well, when he was first diagnosed, they they had him there for a few months. And then once he was stabilized, they released him. But then over the next year or two, his condition, you know, deteriorated. And then he was went back to the hospital. At that time, uh, when he, he got like an infection, and that's, he died kind of indirectly, but from an infection in the, so in he, the nursing So this home. was all in his 80s? That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So he got diagnosed quite late. Late, like late, yes, 79, right. Yeah, 80, yeah. And, um, so, but, you know, he was a really good father, and um, he tried to give me all the opportunities that I, uh, the, sorry, that he never had growing up. Uh, so he worked for the like the civil service, and my mom also worked for the federal government, uh, doing like accounting stuff for the Department of Defense. And I guess they met when they're both in there. And you know, growing up, uh, you know, my dad would take me to like you know whatever like soccer lessons or ice hockey and stuff like that. That you know he didn't get a chance to go to, right? But he wanted to help me get an opportunity to go to those things. And you know when you're when you're young, you don't really appreciate all the effort your dad and mom does for you. And I honestly didn't really you know, appreciate all the effort that they put in to me until probably actually like in my early 30s. Right? I'm 40 now, so I would oh, say what, 30. Do, are you married now? Do you no, 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 no. Married too soon. That's why you look so happy you're <laughs> not married, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps one day, perhaps one day. But yeah, and you know, I... Uh, I realized, you know, all that effort and all that hardship, and you know, sometimes you just don't realize it until it's too late. So, no, it seemed like it. But, but I'm sure you got a chance to let I did. Really knows, yeah. I did. That's good. Yeah, That's I was good. very. Were you there? Were you there with him when he passed? I was. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Just by myself with him in in the hospital. I actually was very lucky to get. I flew back immediately. I booked a ticket the morning. I heard the news that the doctors thought he was going to pass, and I didn't, you know, get to the hospital till like. 2 a.m. and 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 actually, 
my brother and mother were there already like all day many days and they're really tired so they they went home to take a rest and and uh, then I went from the hotel in a taxi there and it was just me and my father and then like literally 20 minutes after I arrived he passed it's like he was waiting right for me you gotta be yeah, kidding me that's oh what happened man. yeah two story so just I was just in the nick of time 20 minutes there and he was you know he was not lucid he was lucid and able he was he was to um, not conscious, but he was okay. alive, and okay, I would yeah. like to think that he, he knew felt. Yeah, I would like to think that because yeah. because it, it is oddly, you know, um, the timing was odd that he passed just twenty minutes after, after you that, came. Yeah. Right. So then you call your mother. And sure. Your yeah, mother yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. They came over, and, and everything happened after. But that. But your mother, how's your mother doing now? It's a struggle. Um, I don't think so because yeah. she spent all her. Yeah. Yeah. So they were. It's kind of my mother and my father, they really lived kind of in their own world. They didn't have a lot of friends outside of uh, work or bringing them into their, you know, personal life. So my mom doesn't really have a strong support network, I think. So it's is your brother living close by? He is, but... Um, is he uh, married with family? I, th I believe he's engaged now okay. to get married. <laughs> but you, yeah, guys, yeah. you guys wait long. Did yeah. your father wait late to get married too? Um, he got... I mean, I'm thinking now, um, I'm almost 26, so my dad must have been. Yeah, I, I think my father was 28. Yeah, well, that was there. late for his time. I yeah, it think. was. Yeah, yeah. For his it, time, yeah. Because yeah, I was right. late for my time. I got married when I was 33. Okay. And that was late because everybody I knew was getting married right out of high school to, to get into college or as soon as they finished college, 21. Really, yeah. Yeah. So they were getting married early. Mm. Yeah. Wow, I, so I think I'll, I'll wait uh, yeah, a little yeah. bit more, but yeah. you know, maybe one day. I'm not saying right. it's out of the cards, but right. perhaps one day. So, right. so go on. So college sure. and what did you do for Yeah, so that? you know, I went to the University of Toronto, which is uh, it's kind of like uh, Canada's version of Harvard, uh, but not as you know maybe fancy. And um, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do at first. I was really interested in, in politics, uh, studying about it, but I got very uh, um, disillusion with it after reading about it right and so I kind of didn't really want to be a part of that world at that time and but I was still you know at the back of my head really interested in different cultures and and, and stuff like that so uh, I double majored in anthropology and uh, philosophy and uh, yeah and that's kind of like when I started getting interested a little bit in Japan was through the anthropology okay. and how so how did that get you interested okay. in Japan because of its long history so Actually, in one of the courses I studied, we studied the Aboriginal people of Japan, the Ainu, up in Hokkaido, right? And, uh, you know, I was doing an essay on it, and I was very interested. And I actually, one, uh, one winter break, I went there to visit, you know, because at the time I was actually dating a Japanese girl. And um, so, yeah, it kind of all, com you know, coalesced. And then I visited uh, Hokkaido and went around there. And What year was that? That was maybe... Oh, when I was maybe 21 or 20, so mm -hmm. yeah, around 2001 or 2002. Okay. And um, yeah, so it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I lost my um, interest in the, you know, the, the aboriginal uh, world of Japan. And, um, you know, I came back to, I graduated and I was working as a, an editor of history books at the time. But, you know, my passion at that time was, was music, right? And music had always been a passion of mine since, you know, my parents got me this, like, little cheap Casio synthesizer when I was, like, really, really small, like 10. And, but I was, you know, then picking up, you know, guitar when I was around 13. But I was really interested in, you know, there's a revolution going on around the early 2000s that, you know, uh, democratized uh, recording technology and... Uh, electronic music production for for anyone right you could you know just spend under a hundred dollars for software and be able to produce almost studio at that time almost studio quality oh, now yeah. definitely studio quality right, right? and on your iPhone uh, yeah exactly exactly you can definitely do that <laughs> so it's really ramped up and um, I was really interested in synthesizers at the time and making like glitchy unique sounds because I thought this is just you know again it was that theme in my life of being attracted to something that's different or strange or well you could say strange or unique or unusual. But wasn't that in one of the movies was Flashdance or one of them they had the kid they were doing that. With the knobs they're tweaking it. Yeah. They were tweaking it but not just that they had it up on top of the car and he did synthesized yeah, yeah, music yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think they went to the school of performing arts. Okay. Those were the students. I forget yeah. the name of the movie. 
But and then the his father was so proud of his yeah. son because he made all the synthesized right? music. Yeah. But you can make the the amazing part is you can make sounds that no one's ever heard of before. Truly unique sounds. It's like making your own instrument. I mean, it still's got the same scale, but um, the sounds are totally unique, right? So that was like it's kind of like my passion, right? But the thing is, you can't really turn that into uh, a career unless you're, you know. Uh, at the right place in the right time and know the right people and you know there's a whole bunch of things that go into that and I wasn't really also I wasn't interested in pop music and stuff like that I was more interested in experimental music mm -hmm. and you're not gonna make a living doing that so you know I graduated uh, and then I uh, because at the time I was you know dating a Japanese girl so I wanted to come to Japan right? it was the next logical step but you'd already been here once I had yeah so there was okay. so how long were you here when you came that one time? just a couple of weeks yeah. okay and now and this is just on your own volition just yes you wanted, and did you go up to Hokkaido to I did. see to see the Ainu yes I did yeah, okay yeah. so you saw the Japanese they have hair on their chest and yeah that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I you know I came back uh, a few years later right and um, yeah it's been 13 years now 12 13 years I've been living here full-time yeah, since then so you know, the, uh, the first thing is when I graduated, I'm like, how do I get into Japan, right? I needed a visa, right? So at the time, you know, I, I was, when I first graduated, I was working as an, an editor of history books, right? And, you know, it was very difficult to, uh, to get into Japan. Um, so I, I figured the easiest way to get in there was to teach English. So I did that, as so many people do, just to get the visa. I can change it and look for another job once I, when I got there. So at the time when I got here, um, I was still, you know, learning about, you know, electronics and music and stuff like that. And one of the things that was really strange for me was, you know, when I first got here, the trains are stopping all the time, right? And, and uh, you know, suicide's a bit of an issue in Japan, right? And um, whereas, you know, back home or in Canada, at least, it's a, kind of like a taboo thing. People don't really talk about it. If it happens, um, there's no like articles saying this person did that. Well, at least in, in 20 years ago, they didn't write about it in the newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe about the issue, but they wouldn't you know, identify individuals. It was still kind of taboo. So at that time, um, I was uh, learning a software called uh, Pure Data. And what it allowed you to do is uh, take kind of signals and you could change them into data and then you could then map that into different kind of uh, synthesizers or anything. So what I did is I took uh, the data for one year of uh, suicides in Japan and I mapped that onto a piano keyboard and I, I created a software program within Pure Data. You create these things called patches and it would randomly trigger uh, a number that represented the number of suicides in a prefecture. Right? It's a little bit more of okay. it, but right? so basically you have, let's say, there was, uh, I don't know, like 50 suicides in, in Tokyo is, in is January. There, is there any video? Was it a video? Was it connected to vi something visual? It could be, but this time it was only it was audio. Just, it was audio, so, so you so could see the spike. You just, okay, you, you could, just hear yeah, the yeah. sounds. Okay, yeah, so you could see that in audio, you could see the spikes, but you'd see, hear the sound. Yes. And it'd be a distinct sound yes, every time yes. something happened. So for example, okay. if there was 50 suicides in the month of January in Tokyo, right. it would play the note number 50. Okay. Right, but of course, you know, some places the numbers so higher, so I had to divide all the numbers so they would fit on a piano keyboard, or the okay. most most of. Them. All right. And and I did this, and I thought it was really cool. And then I was like, well, how do I get this out there, right? So I emailed some editors of different, you know, magazines and that, and it got picked up in Wired magazine in in England. What year was this? This was 2013. 2013. Okay. And I was like, kind of like my first uh, taste of press. I was like, oh, oh my god, wow, this is so cool, right? And uh, yeah, so you know, Wired, the technology magazine, it interviewed me uh, on that. And then they, what, they came here to interview you? No, it was all on the phone. On yeah, the phone, at the interviewed time, you. Yeah. Okay. Was it? Was this also just only audible? Only yes, audio. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, and of course, I, I you know uploaded it and gave. Uh, it's, there was a copy on spot. Uh, sorry, at that time, uh, SoundCloud. So people could hear the yeah, interview. Yeah, yeah. How long was the interview? Um, yeah, it was just like a thirty-minute interview, yeah, but then okay. they, but it was it was a written article that they I wrote, see, right? The well. old-style press, right? This is probably, yeah, I don't know uh, if uh, podcasts were just starting to take off. Who did? How did they title it? What was the title of it? Um, mm -hmm. oh, uh, what was it? 
I actually forget the title. Because no, 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 like you said, it is somewhat morbid. Yeah, yeah. So they had to about spend that, But it, I was yeah. wondering what, what kind of title they put on it. Japan Suicide to Put to Music something or something like, like yeah. that. Something like that. Is that right? It, yeah. It was the okay. idea of um, what was why they were interested in it is because at the time they were interested in, in big data was like the new thing around 2013. And the idea of sonifying uh, random data was interesting to people at that time, right? So... Um, you know, at the time, there was someone at NASA who sonified or took the data of, I believe, um, some telemetry data of Saturn or some space data and over a black hole and made it into music, right? And I thought, well, I can, I know the, the process how to do that. So I did it with, a, with some sort of, uh, now I, you know, a uh, catchy um, or uh, an interesting topic that would, you know, while morbid, it still would create right, attention. Good, good, yeah. right. So anyways, that led to that. And then I think I got a few more interviews at like with Vice Media and some other stuff. And um, so I thought, you know, and I'm still, you know, teaching English at that time. Okay. But then I'm thinking, how do I capitalize on this? What, what else can I do, right? right. So uh, I then uh, learned a little bit more about different sensors and how to connect them to the computer. And I, the next stuff I made, I made a various different projects, including like a radiation detector that would make music out of the radiation detector. And this is, you know, after Fukushima, right? So it was also newsworthy, right? And mm. that got some press. And then I made a, a lie detector machine that uh, you could, you know, put on two people's fingers. And, <clears throat> and it was like, a, the sensor was called a galvanic skin response. And it, it just, it, the resistance changes based on how much you sweat, right? And that would change, that resistance would change uh, the value that the computer would read. And if it was, for example, just like a 10, the value, for example, then it would play like note 10 in a unique way. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I did that with that. And two people were being interviewed and it would like kind of like create a unique composition amongst two people, right? And so I thought, you know, what if uh, people experienced different things in life, not just through reading it, but what if we could experience it in a totally different way through, through, um, making it into sound, right? Would we, how would we experience truth and lies or, or trauma? Would we experience it in a different way rather than if we just read about it? Yes. And yeah, so around that time, I got invited to speak, give a lecture in Iceland to their graduate uh, students on, I think it was a class on technology and music and how it came together. So. Yeah, it was really fun, and then I spoke in, in Norway at a place. Wait, wait, wait. But you were still teaching English in yeah, right. at that time? Yeah. So you took off from your English job that's and went right. to Iceland? And yes. How yeah. long were you there? Just for one lecture, yeah. I was there for okay. a week, and then... They flew you there? They did. They paid for it. Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty good. And then... And your first time being in Iceland? It, yeah. So it was loved. It, it was really great. Uh, and, uh, you know, I made the most out of that trip, though. I got to also... Uh, uh, do something similar in uh, Norway. They have, um, the, it's kind of like the Norwegian Center for Technology and Music, and I give a talk there. So I come back to Japan after this, right? And I'm like, well, I can't make a living with, with weirdo experimental music, right? And, you know, it was really frustrating for, for me because I was getting some sort of traction, right? Uh, in, in, in media and getting invited to places, but I can't pay rent with that. I, I could, you know, go on these trips, but can't make rent, and I'm still an English teacher at that time, so it's really frustrating for me, right? Because, you know, you want to build a career, make yourself, and the only way to go to make a career with ex kind of that experimental electronic music is uh, probably to go in as a professor and then, you know, you know do like a PhD in some sort of like a uh, technology and music program somewhere. And at that time, that wasn't really appealing to me because it's, you know, a very long process. And so I realized at that point is I have to change my career, right? And uh, I said, I don't want to be an now English how long teacher. Had you been, how long had you been in Japan? Yeah, for time? like f maybe around five years. Five years, okay. So you're five like years that. in now. So I started uh, learning visual art stuff. I was very, you know, late to the game with that, and I never studied visual art, and I'm actually really horrible at drawing still. But um, I had to find a way to monetize creativity that was uh, 
a process that any reasonable person could could do, right? Because um, you know it's very, like I said, super difficult to monetize music, especially nowadays with Spotify and that. And your artists are getting like one cent of stream, and you know user uh, user experience be was becoming very uh, popular at the time, and. I realized, well, this is something I, I can do, right? And uh, now, for your listeners, if they don't know what user experience design is, it's like, imagine, well, there's a lot of different analogies to explain what it is, but one way to explain it is that, like, you know, an it's like an architect that builds a digital product, but also we focus on someone's experience inside of that digital product. Uh, for example, how do they navigate the certain sections? How do they feel uh, when they're using it? Um, so what, what naturally makes sense? So for example, like if you go to a grocery store back home, where is usually the milk? Where 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 they put the milk? Do, right. do they put it in the front of the store? No, they no. put it in the back. It's That's always right. in the See? back because you know you have to go in the back, right? So they they guide you through that, That's and right. they also put up little items that you would never think to buy right by the register. Yes. And that's exactly the same digital. thing that a user experience designer does for digital product. Is the same thing. So when you come, so once you start with that, it, you can be led audibly through different corridors that you may not necessarily think of, or just something like that, or just or well, 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 just the visual the design. You oh, these are visual. This now. is all visual. visual so now. yeah, okay, I had so to the same get, thing. I had to get out of the audio game and right. totally go for the visual thing. And uh -huh. at the time, I was uh, uh, teaching uh, English at a. At a, at a public company uh, called Crowdworks, and um, that was kind of like my first uh, taste of a tech company. And then from there, I got a mentor in UX design, and then I st got some opportunities to uh, practice that. And I took a course online, and I started learning about that. But at the same time, I was also learning uh, like video special effects. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you've probably heard of the software After Effects yes, from Adobe, yeah, and um, yeah, I was really interested in that, right? So at the same time, I was learning that. So I had the mentor in the, in the UX and UI, right, designing the buttons and what the layout looks like of software for the, for the user interface and then the user experience. And there, in any mid-sized company, the, that job is kind of together. Okay. It's only in big companies like at Google where they will separate the, the user experience and the user interface. So I was learning the After Effects on the side as well, because remember, my, my goal was to get more uh, visual tool sets so that I can create more output. So at that time, there was a, a prize for this fashion company called DKNY, right? Donna Karen New York, and maybe not as popular these days, but I was like, I'm gonna try it, right? This is free to enter, right? So I made kind of this, uh, they were rebranding, uh, and they wanted people to make like kind of a animated commercial or an animated um, logo. So I created like a very vivid, r random, crazy colors, uh, and you know I submitted it, and I won that, right? And I was really, you know, again, remember I never took art classes right. ever right. in high school or university or anything, right? So um, yeah, I was really happy to win that, and then uh, yeah, I started doing you know, more visual art in that. And this is when I started applying to all these tech companies. And uh, yeah, and, and you know, it's been history ever since that, yeah. And so when, what were you doing to make money though? You didn't go through that, because you stopped teaching English. That's right, yeah, so, so but, but then I, I, I was able to transfer at the company that I was working at. So while I, so it was a private tech, uh, sorry, no, a public tech company, right. and I was teaching English there, and I found a mentor, and and, and because I was teaching English to uh, the executives of the company, you know, I I had like a way to to transfer my job, right, or, or to get a taste of doing something right. different, right. because I knew the decision makers, right, and I could say, hey, can I? I've been learning this. Can can I, you know, uh, help the team out a little right, bit? Right, right. And and I, sure. Yeah, and they said sure, right? And so, so you're still with them now? No, no, I, I've changed companies since then. Okay. But then, you know, at first it was like 50-50 doing English and then working UX, and eventually full time UX there. And then I just changed different companies, and and then it's been doing. Yeah. So what do you do now? Now I, I, I work at a company called Masrika, and it's like a, kind of the Japan's version of Salesforce. Okay. And, uh, and how long have you been with them? I've been with them for over a year now, and okay. uh, basically I am designing uh, 
the user interface and the experience of, of what it's like to uh, use their software. And uh, I'm you know, a member of a team, it's not just me, a team that works on it. How many people? How many yeah, people it's a four-member team. And okay, are they all, uh, all Japanese but you? Yeah, I'm the only person from North America in the company. Yeah. So they're speaking in Japanese? Yes. Then? So you have to speak Japanese. That's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So you don't. Is it all men? By uh, we it's it's split. Yeah, our team mm -hmm. is um, two, two girls, women. Two guys. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, three women and two men. Yeah. So. Are you guys? So it's five of you. Is are they all around the same age as you? Um, are you the oldest yeah, about one? that. Yeah. yeah, I'm closer to the oldest one, but um, yeah, we're uh, yeah we're not. Um, like early 20s, just graduated. No, okay. we're, we're like around yeah, in season, our 30s. Season. Yeah. And everybody's been with other companies. They've yeah, done something. yeah, that's right. They're right. They're so all mid-career. They're, they're mid -career, or what yeah, they yeah. say in Japan, mid-career. Right, mid-career, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're still looking for your niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what is it like working with them? Is it, is it pretty, um, how do you find it compared to what you've done before? So it's, yeah, it's a challenge. So actually currently I'm also working for uh, an American company. Uh, you're doing two companies? Yes. But you're working on software. You're working on the face of the, yeah, the software interface. So interface, okay. And 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 so in uh, an Amer I'm working for a Web three uh, company in America that is interested in kind of the whole cryptocurrency space, and um, you know working in America with an American company compared to working with a Japanese company is totally night and day. In what way? What do you in th what so many ways. What are the, what's, what, give me a few of the biggest ways. Sure. So uh, in America, or with an American company, I have so much freedom to do any sort of design I want. You're giving more autonomy. And they do not care about small little errors or details, right? like if something's one pixel off or something like that, right? Okay. Whereas in Japan, it's less about the idea and it's about the presentation of it, right? So like everything, like the most smallest detail is, is super focused on it. Whereas the American companies know like we got to get to market, get to market, get to market, push it out, we'll fix it later. Whereas in Japan, they'll wait months and months and months or years before something is pushed out the door, right? And then they lose their, 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 uh, their advantage in being the first out the door, right? But so their product is, when it does come out the door, there's no, I mean, it works. It works. And it works perfectly. perfectly Maybe, perfectly, yeah. Or more than, than the others. But in this, or could be too late to that. I know what you're saying. I think, but in that field, when you're talking about technology, because so much is being churned out, you don't have time to look at the small things. Yeah. Get it out and do, yeah. and fix it afterwards. Yeah. But Japan's so risk adverse. Yes, yes. They will not, I mean, they will jump in, that's why they jump in front of trains. Right, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, a failure is a failure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> so it's, um, you know, there are a lot of positives about working uh, in Japan, of course, like uh, it's very secure um, and uh, it's more responsibility is more shared amongst the team, right? So if I make a mistake, it's not the end of the day, but if I make a mistake in the American company, it's like, you're gone, right? That's it, it's someone, well, maybe they'll give you a few chances, but okay, you know so what I mean, it's, 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 it's right, different, right. Right? right? No, because you're part of the team, and right. nobody feels here. I mean, you yeah. stay together, right? and they will cover your back. That's right, but you know. Right. In the States, no. you, it's on you, right, right. now it's on you. It's all in the final output. We'll give you autonomy, but sure. if you mess up, you're right. out of here. That's right. And so, so there's, so there's, they're the both, give and takes. there's, yes. So it's really interesting experiencing the difference too. And, you know, hierarchy is a whole thing, you know, with like That's in right. Japan with the bosses and the managers and, and whereas in, uh, well, especially I guess in the tech world in America, that's not so much the case. Um, perhaps only I'm guessing just in maybe the tech world, but I don't know, uh, Maybe in general, right? Like it, it's you can just approach the you know CEO or it's no big they deal. They usually have it, open door policies yeah, in the yeah. US where you can go to the top person yeah. and tell them you you know what you're concerned about. Yeah. But then you still have to go through the hierarchy. But still, you have his ear. Yes, yeah. Whereas yeah. here, how dare you? Right, yeah. You're so, fired for doing that. Right. So it's a totally <laughs> different experience. And That's right. so you know, um, yeah. At, at, you know, late at night I work for with doing the American company stuff, and then also on the weekends and that. And, uh, and then, of course, during the day in Japan. And, and yeah, I get to see the very stark contrast, eh? And I think to myself, it's like, yeah, that's why, you know, uh, blah, 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 or, or that's why that. And I mean, it's good and bad on both sides, right? So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel torn, like, 
whether you know you think you might go back you think you might go back to canada or do you think you'll the thing is you know there's so much opportunity in the west and it's all about what you said about uh the japanese being risk averse right so um like it's very like let's say if i wanted to start my own tech company in japan it's just super difficult to raise funding uh uh, venture capital funding right it's because they don't want to take a risk on anything so unless it's a business model that uh, has proven itself, for example, like, you know, if you can say this is, you know, Uber, like Uber, then they're like, okay, this works in America, we can do it, right? But if it's like a totally new uh, idea, no, th- it's not going to get funded. I would challenge that idea this okay. way only, saying this, that because you're a foreigner, mm-hmm. you have more opportunities here than you could ever imagine. Interesting. And they would let you do it because it's not a Japanese feeling. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a foreign, it's a, <laughs> yeah. I can and see you, that. And they, and, they, and they would give you the funding. This really? Is the Interesting. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't they? Because you're not Japanese. Right. And they, and they know that you've been educated differently. Mm-hmm. You've been educated to be creative. Mm-hmm. Japanese aren't. Mm-hmm. They've been educated to do mm-hmm. what they're told to do. Mm-hmm. Very mil- militaristic. Yes, yes, yes. Very yes. much so. Yeah, yeah. And it has its place it in does. the world. But if it's about the field that you're in now, yeah. You can run the show. You can yeah. say this was going to take, and they'll say, "All right, we'll do it." So that's interesting. I you would mentioned. think, yeah, that is something. Because, to but think only about. because you're a foreigner. Mm-hmm. Now, some Japanese trying to do it. No, you're being rebellious. Mm-hmm. You should get in right, place. Yeah. Uh, you're the nail sticking mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. You're, the you're, gone, <laughs> you're gonna yeah? get no. You can, no. Yeah. You're supposed to be wadi wadi. Right. Yeah. The together, team. Yeah. But you don't have to be. So what I realize, though, is it, you know, <laughs> a lot of people are like. Is it this or that, right? And I realize it doesn't have to be like that, right? That, so I think you know, the, <laughs> the best solution, you know, I think, there, like you said, um, there is a place for, for the Japanese style of doing things. And, and there's also a place for the Western. It doesn't have to be that one or the other. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be best to create like a, a team of, of both that both do what they do best in their own way? So, you know, if you want, you need that detail for, for you know, some aspects before you produce a product, right? But you also need the creativity in the West. And if you bring the both together, wouldn't you get like a, a you know, a really great product, right? Sounds to me like you got a pitch stick, <laughs> a winning pitch, man. You should go with it. Mm, something because it, cause think about it. Everything that we have, everything that man has out here that's been created was at one time what? An idea. Mm. And ideas cost you nothing. Mm. And you were trained to come up with ideas. Mm, mm. They would love the new one. And, you, and you're building their confidence and their trust already because mm. you're working with them and mm. you're saying, okay, I'll do it that way. Mm. However, mm. what if we do it this way? Mm. You're learning techniques now. Mm. I think this is the best business school on the planet. Mm. Before I end, Roy, there's a question I'd like to ask sure. everyone. With all the knowledge you have now, mm-hmm. if you could take that knowledge and go back in time mm-hmm. and speak to the younger Roy, mm-hmm. what would you tell him and how old would you be? So honestly, like, it took me a long time in my life to find my place and I think for a very long time I was very selfish and focused on myself and as soon as I changed that focus into trying to help someone else everything else changed in my life as soon as you figure out how can I help somebody right and it's not just about you know charity or something like it's not like that it's just like how can you help someone achieve their goal or their, their they have their projects and if you can help them you're gonna end up improving your life right, right. so I, I think truly that's the most important uh, piece of advice I'd give myself if I could go back in time because I found out that way too late in the game you'd be a very lucky man by doing it thank I you, appreciate Roy. it thank you I want to thank all of you for watching or listening to this podcast And never forget, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the stars. Because you're too blessed to be stressed.